All right, we're here on our fifth interview today. Uh, we will let the gentleman to my left introduce himself. I'm Tom Convery. Uh, I was born in South Boston, lived in Dorchester, and during the Depression we came to Medford. Uh, I left Medford High School my junior year when I was 17. I figured I was going to win World War II by myself, and my father had to sign my enlistment papers. We went up to Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and I left there at four degrees below zero, and five days, la five days later I arrived in Biloxi, Mississippi, with a winter uniform on at 115 degrees. And we lived in tents and uh, between the barracks, because we were at Keesler Field in Mississippi, down in Biloxi. And uh, we went to bed at night. We had to check our beds for scorpions and snakes. And we had to check our shoes in the morning because they were inclined to go in there. And um, I went through uh, Air Force basic training, which ran 13 weeks. It's a good, good training program. And uh, we went to bayonet training one day, and the bayonet was about, was about this long, it was 18 inches from World War I. And uh, the instructor put on demonstrations with it, and he grabbed a big guy and threw the rifle at him and said, make a lunge at me. And the fella did, and he sort of knocked the guy all over the place and picked up the rifle and threw it back at him again, said, make a lunge again. And, this time when the fellow lunged, he made what was called a parry. He didn't come straight. And when the instructor reached for the blade, it wasn't there. It went right through him. And uh, believe me, we all paid attention in that class. And uh, so Kiesler Field, as I say, the basic training was good. And uh, then we, I, uh, I, I wanted to be a ball turret gunner on a 17. And then I found out it was the most dangerous position to go because it was the belly of the aircraft and when she came in, sometimes they landed and there was no way the belly turret gunner could get out. So they made me a cook. And they sent me to cook some baker school up in Fort Warren, uh, Wyoming. And that was an experience. I remember in June, we had two feet of snow up there and we had uh, hail like golf balls. And uh, if you sneaked out on a pass and they caught you, it was very simple. They had you dig a, dig a six by six hole, put your pass in there, fill it in. If you wanted to use your pass and go to town again, you had to dig it up and get it. Well, of course, not too many people dug it up. Uh, another thing, if, if you didn't do what you're supposed to do, they filled your pack with uh, 72 pounds of sand and you walk the perimeter at nighttime, and of course you'd wear the you'd wear the, stri the straps off after a period of time, and uh, there wasn't too many people had a second turn at that. They had to walk the perimeter at nighttime with this backpack. From uh, Fort Warren, I went out to uh, Hillfield, Utah, and uh, that's where the Mormon people were, Church of Latter-day Saints. And uh, I, went, I went out with a mom and girl, and uh, when the, I was a Catholic, and when they found out that I was coming into town and paying two dollars for a room for a night in Ogden, they said, no, 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 you come here and stay with us. And they used to take me to church on Sunday to a Catholic church. And uh, uh, the names of the people were Butts, and they're a great family. And, uh, but uh, they, were, they were good to people. From, uh, Hillfield, I now went down to Clovis, New Mexico, and that was a B-29 outfit. And from Clovis, we then went up to uh, Ely, Nevada. Now, Ely, it took three-day pass just to get off the base. I mean, you were in the boonies there. <clears throat> and uh, so I'd say, uh, uh, what do you do? And you'd say, well, I do A. What do you do? I do B. And what do you do? You say, I undo A. And you, I undo B. No one knew what they did. We took 12 men to a tent. And uh, the only way to get out of there was to join the paratroops airborne. So I did. <clears throat> now they shut me down to Fort Benning, Georgia. That was quite an experience. And of course, I told them down there that I'd been through Air Force Basic. 
Are you kidding? We're going to give you basic training here at Air Force. Well, it, it was good. The Air Force training was good, but the uh, down at Fort Benning, I was in airborne uh, training, and we ran an hour every day. And uh, you'll find if you run extensive uh, periods of time and you ever get a cramp in your side, well, what you do is you put your thumbs in and you squeeze, and what happens is you focus on your thumbs and you forget the, forget the pain, right? And we had to, uh, they were great for push-ups. If you had a line going up a tree and they could break through there, everybody back had to do 15 push-ups. And along would come the instructor and he'd say, did you do 15? Yes. Give me 15 more for not cheating. So I'd give him 15 more. And, or you'd say, yes, I cheated. Well, give me 15 more for cheating. So we're going to, you're going to get 45 push-ups. Fort Benning, uh, that was interesting. That was infantry school. And uh, we had hand grenade practice one day. It was the uh, pineapple-shaped hand grenade. And uh, it was a, called a fragmentation grenade. And you see in the movies, they throw one in the house, and the house disappears. It never happened. It's a fragmentation grenade. It might kill everybody in the room. It might blow out the windows. But uh, in the movies, it, it, uh, it adds a little spice. So he's given, the instructor's given Ben uh, hand grenade training, and he said, now whatever you do, don't run. If a hand grenade falls near your face into it, and don't run. Well, he's got the hand grenade in his hand, and he drops the hand grenade, and what do you think happened? Everybody ran. And the hand grenade went, pap, was a cap. Now we had to go back. And that sergeant, I'll tell you, he chewed us up one side. What did I just tell you not to do? Of course, it's easy to say don't do it, but when it happens, it's a whole different ball. So, from Fort Benning, uh, the, uh, I got injured in paratroop training. I tore up my right knee. And uh, now they send me to Maryland, Maryland to Brooklyn, and now I'm over in Brooklyn going to France and the infantry. We, we went over on a Liberty ship, which was like a dishpan sitting in the ocean, and uh, every 10 minutes we changed course for submarine attacks. And uh, so that was quite an experience too. E deck goes first, then D deck, and so up. The minute that thing went off of the submarine, A deck went first, B deck. How about E deck? The hell with E deck. Everybody from South, they. Uh, they were going to get up and deck. Now we got to France, and I was in an outfit called the 106th Infantry Division, which had been annihilated in the bulge, and I was going there as a replacement. So, uh, at Rennes, France, they gave us back our colors. I mean, they give you your flags and everything back to the ceremony. And uh, they told us we were now going into St. Nazaire. St. Nazaire, Brest, and Lorien had been bypassed in World War II, and we were now going to go in there. We uh, got my, I was a squad leader, well actually I was an assistant, but the squad leader, he had a habit of walking around the thing at nighttime, which was a no-no, so they shipped him back to some medical place, and I became the squad leader. I had 12 men under me. And, uh, the sick sergeant, he brought my rations. He cheated my squad out of six sticks of gum. So I went to him. I said, hey, sergeant, just keep your mouth shut. So I went to the platoon leader, a lieutenant. He said, nothing I can do for you, so he put me back with the sergeant. And we went into St. Nazaire, and I looked on the tree and it said, Convery, first scout. Well, if you want to get rid of a guy, you make him first scout. So, I didn't know whether the Germans would let me go through and wait and get the main body or whether they'd get me first. So, needless to say, my pants were moist. So, I'm, running, I'm going up the road into St. Nazaire, and the lieutenant pulls up on a jeep. How you doing, Convery? 
I said, if my pants weren't bloused, means tucked under, I said, you'd have no problem following me up this road. Ah, you'll be all right, and he got in the Jeep and went off. Behind me, I had troops and vehicles. Something moved in front of me, I opened up and fired eight rounds from my M1. I turned around, everybody had disappeared. There were no trucks, no people, nothing. So now my pants were really moist. So we got into the area that night, and he made me a squad leader again, but uh, it, it was a harrowing experience. And uh, when the war ended, uh, they, they brought over professors from Boston University, and they set up a school at Shrivingham, England, and Biarritz, France. And so I went to, I hadn't graduated from high school, but I was the first sergeant, so I put down that I had graduated from high school. And uh, so I was able to go to Biarritz University, pick up a couple of college credits, I hadn't even got out of high school. And uh, then they shipped us home and uh, back to Fort Devens. I signed up for the reserves, and uh, so I went back to college on out of the GI Bill. And uh, I got a notice one day, and they said, you're recalled to active duty for Korea. Said, Korea, I hadn't done a thing in four years. What are you talking about? Oh, no, we want you. So they took me down to uh, Camp Dix, and I went down to Keesler Field, Mississippi, and they said, we're going up to Sampson Air Force Base, upstate New York, uh, Geneva, New York, Hobart College. And uh, he said, uh, we're going to reopen the base. Now, this used to be the Navy basic training center during World War II. No windows, no heat, no mattresses, and each guy that came in was each issued eight blankets. Well, of course, we lost a lot of kids to pneumonia and stuff like that. The uh, commanding officer was a guy named George Glavy from Medford. And uh, I was a staff sergeant, four stripes, and there were guys with five and six stripes. And uh, the guys who had been recalled were bitter because they had started families, they had started education courses, they had started businesses. And they hadn't done a thing in four years, and they got recalled, and believe me, they were better. So he said to the master and the tech, would you be the squadron commander? And they said, no. No, I'm just doing my year, and I'm out of here. So he said to me, would you be the squadron commander? I said, sure. So I was squadron commander, giving orders to people above me. And then a new colonel came in, and he became base commander. So this major, Captain Glavy said, Tom, would you stay on and be the first sergeant? I said, yeah, so I stayed on. And a few late, weeks later, more people came in, and uh, I got a direct commission. I was a tech sergeant one day, and I was a second lieutenant the next. Of course, with that, they ship you right off the base, and any guy that sees you and renders you a salute, you have to give him a dollar. So I had to give eight dollars away the first day there, and uh, they shipped me out to uh, Colorado and I went to uh, uh, Air Combat Intelligence School and from there we then went over to Korea. The thing that I found out about 15 years later was at Ely, Nevada, I was part of the A-bomb program. Didn't even know it. And then when I went down to Clovis, New Mexico, I was in the first B-29 outfit, which dropped the bombs. So. Uh, it, it, it was interesting. The Korean War was, um, I was assigned to uh, 67 tactical reconnaissance wing. They dropped bombs, then they'd fly over and see what the assessment was and see how they did and all that. And uh, so wherever I went and there was a school, it was Hobart, it was Ali of the Lake in Texas, I, I took graduate courses there. And the Air Force eventually sent me back for my master's degree. But uh, the Korean War was interesting. I came out of Korea with a lung condition akin to tuberculosis, and I was on tuberculin drugs for years. I haven't been on them now for probably 40, 50 years. But uh, it was one of the things that came out of Korea. 
Uh, Korea was an experience. You didn't drink the water unless they gave Melissa bag. Didn't brush your teeth unless you gave water Melissa bag. And uh, when we came back from Korea, I'd say a month, maybe two months, we had to give stool specimens up at Hanscom Field because uh, one of the things you pick up in Korea were worms. And the worm would take a man 200, 250 pounds. The worms would whittle him down from inside maybe to 80, 90 pounds. So that was a thing that we had to do every time after Korea. Uh, the Vietnam War uh, started, we started sending people over there in 59, and uh, they, uh, I was in charge of Air Force recruiting. I was chief of advertising publicity for New York and New England advertising. And uh, so our job was to get the people to join the Vietnam War. The interesting thing there was, I would come in from Long Island into New York in my uniform. But if I went downtown New York, I put on civilian clothes. Because it wasn't prudent to go down in your uniform. Because uh, we were baby killers and we were called there. And then we'd go home at night and put our uniform on back again. But uh, the Vietnam War, my oldest son, he served in Korea. And uh, I then, I put my, I was a regular officer, career officer, and I put in my uh, papers for retirement, and they were going to assign me to Thailand. And troops coming out of Cambodia and tri Thailand and fighting in Vietnam, uh, we weren't supposed to be coming out of Cambodia and Thailand. And so if you got shot down there, you're on your own. And uh, it was, uh, as I say, I got, I got pulled off it because I, uh, uh, I had put in retirement papers. As I said, I was a regular officer, a career officer. And I retired as a major, but I probably could have retired as a full colonel, but my oldest son had been in 16 schools. And uh, uh, so I said, well, I've got to reshape my priorities. So I said, I have to go, I have to get out and go to a place where they'll go to one school and I want them to know their grandparents before they die. So I retired in 67, my mother died in 70 here in Medford and my father died eight weeks later. He just quit. As long as my mother was alive, he was fine, but when she died, he quit. But all my kids graduated from Medford High, as did I. And uh, they got to know their grandparents, which was important. And uh, so I got out September, well, I put in my retirement papers in January, and it took two senators and a congressman to get me out because I was a regular <laughs> officer in a critical field, in a critical field, I was information officer. And uh, so you might say the Air Force was a little unhappy with me. And I put in my papers in January. I had a teaching job in Medford on the 4th of September. I got out the 1st of September because the two senators and the congressmen really pushed it. But uh, there were a lot of unhappy people because I was a regular and I was in critical. But uh, I've made, I, I'm not happy, I unhappy rather. I went back teaching at Medford High and uh, became very much involved here in the community and... Uh, <clears throat> what did you teach? I taught history, government, civic, uh, history, government, civics, law enforcement. I worked with kids with social, emotional problems. I was a job placement counselor. I was just a principal of summer school for two years. I did everything but sweep the floors on Saturday, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, but it was, I retired from teaching in 91. And uh, as I say, I've been active in Medford, and uh, much like you're doing here, I run a program where we interview World War II veterans, and a copy of it goes to the Library of Congress. It's, it's started by the Library of Congress, and one copy stays here, and we're gonna do a TV show on it. And it's called The Greatest Generation Veterans of World War II. So we've been at that now about five or six weeks, because 
We're losing about 3,000 World War II veterans a month. And uh, I, just, I just buried a friend the other day, and uh, that's the way it is. To, uh, I guess the only thing that uh, I have left is you shared a little bit of combat, but was there anything, any major combat experience that you... Well, the only combat experience was going into St. Nazaire. Uh -huh. And... Uh, uh, what happened when you got there, anything? Or? Well, I met a German sergeant some years later when I was a captain in the Air Force in Germany, and I was talking to him. He says, oh, I was stationed at St. At Nazaire. I said, yeah. He said, everything was mined and zeroed in. He said, we've been there since 1940. So we were in for a tough time. Uh, when I looked around and I saw no one behind me, I've had the same nightmare for 61 years. I wake up at night, and I have to wake up, because if I don't, I'm afraid I wet the bed. And uh, it's called post-traumatic stress syndrome. And uh, I've had the same nightmare for 61 years. So, uh, but uh, as I say, when you look around and all the guys behind you and the vehicles are all gone, I think they drove the vehicles into the woods or something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, you'd be, uh, you'd be a little scared. I know I was. And as I said, uh, I had moist pants. Uh, it'd be better saying I, I wet my pants because uh, I was scared to death. You know, all by yourself there. And we had very little training. We had just replaced an outfit that had been annihilated in the bulge. And we came in, and as I say, we really didn't know each other. We didn't have training. And here we were going in to go after St. Nazaire. And uh, I read quite a bit about it later. And as I said, this German side and said, you wouldn't have had a chance because they've been sitting there since 40. Here we are at the end of 45 and 46, and okay. they're just looking out watching us. So. All right, I think that's, uh, you guys think of anything major that he missed? I can't. All right. So I retired as a major, went in as a private, came out as a major. My my brother sent me a telegram that says, congratulations on your major accomplishment. And someone else said, Major, look, Major, look, Major, buy a funny book. Yeah. So, uh, no, it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was quite different being a tech sergeant enlisted and then being an officer, a whole different ballgame. And uh, so it, uh, when we, we went over on that uh, Liberty ship to Sequel, 1,700 guys on the ship, and they all came down with diarrhea. Now, you're out in the ocean, and here's this ship. And what had happened, they had cooked corned beef, put it away, took it out, and reheated it, and they gave it to the troops. And, I mean, I'll tell you, they had to hose everything down on that ship. And then they lined us all up, and they take your name, and they gave you what was called a GI spoon, like this. And it was filled up with bismuth and paragoric. And I'll tell you, that'll tighten you up in a hurry. And you had to give you conry and you had, and you had to take it. You couldn't say, well, I'll get it. No, no, no. But uh, that was something, really. 1,700 guys with diarrhea. Oh, gee, unreal. And you're out in the middle of the ocean. You know, you can't run down to McDonald's or someplace like that. And, and uh, so there were a lot of funny things happened, too. I was.